All right, welcome everyone to our June 21st, 2022 Summer Solstice 2111 Upgrades webinar. We are so excited to be sharing this with y'all um, to let you see some of these changes that are coming in 2111. So we have this webinar today. We are repeating the same webinar on Thursday. Um, and then in two weeks, we'll go ahead and have the Q&A sessions where you can come on in and ask any questions and things like that. If you do not have a test server, you don't have access to 2111 just yet. However, we are upgrading our demo site, which is the intranet.bywatersolutions.com. Com. Um, and the next time that gets updated uh, in probably about an hour, I believe it is, um, it'll have 2111 push to it. So that's a site that you can always head to and try out some of these things. I think I have probably the agreement of everyone when I say that 2111 is not a significant workflow change uh, upgrade. It, this is one of those upgrades that we love because it's lots of little things that make us happy. It's all those nice little tweaks and adjustments and um, great little things like that that make our lives so much easier. So we're very, very excited about all of these um, updates that are happening. Um, Sarah, why don't you talk just really quick about where they can find lots of information about all of 2111? Make sure I unmuted. Um, yes, so I'm going to post all of this in the chat momentarily, but there is the upgrade hub on our website in the blog. So there's the upgrade hub. So that has links to the full release notes, um, links to the uh, webinar and QA course um, itself, and that is where you can register for the Q&A if you are not already registered. Uh, the recordings from both uh, both webinars and the Q&A will be sent out to attendees and will also be posted um, on that webinar um, post as well. And then the agenda for today is also in the chat. Awesome. All right, well, everyone knows me now. Um, my name is Donna Wachowski. I'm one of the educators here with Bywater Solutions. And uh, Sarah, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yes, uh, my name is Sarah. I'm also an educator here at Bywater and I'm located in Maryland. Oh, I forgot to mention y'all, I am no longer in Florida. I'm now in Northern Kentucky, so I have moved. Um, and who's this Kelly person we see here? <laughs> Hi y'all, I was dragged back from sales <laughs> to assist with the 2111 upgrade webinars and sadly, Andrew is no longer with us. Um, he has joined the public library world so we congratulate him immensely. And so I maybe many people know me but I'm a resident of the great state of Maine. Super happy to be here to talk about fun 2111 things. Awesome. And then we also have an everyone knows Kelly because she's famous. Monday night. She's a she's an influencer at this point, right? Um, <laughs> and then we also have with us Heba. Heba, who are you? Hi, I'm Heba. Um, I I'm an implementation support, which means I kind of float between support, education, and data. Um, you've probably seen me on a ticket if you put in anything report related. Um, and that's that's a lot of what I do and I'm in Kansas. Awesome. So um, just something to be aware of with our demo site. Um, it is, I don't wanna say it's down right now, since it is freely available to anyone who wants to use it and we do not have any restrictions on what you do with it. There are times where people log into it and basically delete the users. So no one else can log into it. And it appears that we're in the midst of that right now. Um, now this site does get refreshed every three hours and so it will be up very quickly again back to where you're able to use it. You'll know it's been fixed when you can see a pink background instead of the gray background that is currently on there. Um, so just kind of a heads up on that one. So and again, uh, major, major thanks to Kelly for for stepping in and helping us out. We really appreciate yes. it. Um, we were all very saddened when Andrew left us, but we are very excited to have him back in the world in the public libraries. And he is with one of our partner libraries, so we still get to work with him. But uh, Kelly, we genuinely appreciate you coming in. And then this is Heba's first go round at Upgrade. So not nervous at all, right, Heba? <laughs> awesome. All right, so I think we're ready to go ahead and jump right in. 
And looking at our agenda, who goes first? Looks like that is me. Um, all right, so we've got a couple of I was looking for OPAC and public services. Most of them are pretty quick. Um, the first one, actually start over here, um, is a change to how you can um, select what libraries are displayed at the library's link on your OPAC. So here in, oh, let me share my screen. You need to do that first. There we go. Okay. Um, so here in administration under libraries, there is a new um, option for whether or not it is public. So we can see here that all of our locations are public except for the West Branch. And so what this means is if we hop on over to our OPAC and look here under the libraries link, West Branch does not show up. Pretty straightforward, but this used to require um, a ticket and some code. So this just makes it more straightforward for anyone who wants to have that um, show up differently. Um, the next one is bug 28180, which is use a light box gallery to display images um, on the detailed pages of the OPAC. So the staff interface side of this one came out with 2105. Um, but what this means um, is that when you are looking at an item like this in the um, in the staff interface, so it's been showing up like this since 2105, where you can either have multiple image sources that are built into Koha, or you can add a local cover image like we've got here. And then when you hop on over to the OPAC, we now have the same option here. So this is great for adding custom images and making sure that your patrons um, in the OPAC detail view will be able to see all of the um, covers that you want showing for that um, bib. And then finally. Sarah, um, yeah. Sarah, we, we had a question. Okay. Does the public setting affect anything else? The ability to place holds for that branch, et cetera. So that was the other. Uh, um, okay feature you talked about first. Mm -hmm. So does that public setting affect anything else? The ability to place holds for that branch, et cetera? Um, it shouldn't. Uh, there's a separate option for pickup location. So it doesn't affect anything with that. It should just be whether or not it shows up at that library's link. Um, libraries that are not listed here do still show up here. So you can still search for items that are located at that individual library. Um, it's really just for whether they're showing up here. Any, sorry, Miss. that. Thank you, Kelly, for jumping in with the question. Um, all right. Any other questions on that one or the um, cover image? Okay. Um, all right. And then, Wait. oh, yeah. <laughs> one more. Yes. To the newest feature you talked about, if we want the local image to take priority in the light box, can we do that? Great question. Um, you should be able to, although I have to double check what the setting is to make that one take priority. Um, but I will, let me see where that question came from so I can get back to you on that. Yep, we, if any questions we don't answer during it, we will post them on our Q&A. Um, so we record all the questions. So you all will be using these features and thinking about these features in a little different way than we would sometimes. So um, it's usually stump the educator <laughs> in our upgrade webinars and we will post our answers and we can always email you directly as well. Yeah, and I'm seeing um, also a question about uh, suppressing Koji if an image does not show up and that is um, something that, um, I believe uh, Lucas is able to do with some code, so we can send the information about that. Um, the incorrect image, I am less sure about how that is resolved if Kochi shows the incorrect image, uh, but 
again, we'll copy it down, look into it, unless Donna or Kelly or Heba, you will say, since it is based purely on ISBN, we are dependent on Amazon, Google Books, and Open Library having the correct link. Um, and so that is what sometimes happens is that they have the wrong image. And so there's nothing we can really do with that um, to correct it other than I, you know, report it to Amazon or Open Library or something like that, but there's nothing else. Mm -hmm. And the COSI server is going to grab that first ISBN. So if you have the correct ISBN in the second or third place of your ISBN, it is going to take that first. So you could always toggle your ISBN um, mark fields and make one more pro higher in the reading down of the mark list. And that might help as well if you do have the correct one, but it's showing the wrong link. Thank you both. Um, and I have taken down the other question, um, taken down the other questions and we'll be in touch um, with the answer to those. Um, all right, and then our third piece, um, and this kind of crosses over into um, some of the other areas that we'll discuss, but the third piece is 24223, um, converting the OPAC nav system preference to a news block. Um, and similarly, 24224, converting OPAC nav bottom system preference to a news block. So OPAC nav um, and OPAC nav bottom were both system preferences. And um, instead of living in system preferences, they now live here in HTML customizations. So um, if you have used the news section in tools, um, it's going to look very similar where it's got the location. You can customize which of these shows up per library uh, publication date. You can have them automatically expire, preview the content, edit the same way um, that you've been editing for your news um, items. So you can do colors, uh, whatever sort of customizations you would like there. And so we've got OPAC nav bottom, OPAC nav, the main user block typically is going to be um, cover flow if you have that, OPAC credits, and then the login instructions and how this shows up. So if we go back home here. So now you can directly edit OPAC nav, OPAC nav bottom. We've got our OPAC credits here. Um, this again was the cover flow and then the login instructions are showing up right there. So these were all um, options, things that could be edited as a system preference, but this just makes it much more user friendly um, and much easier to access um, than it was as a system preference. Any questions about, about um, that one? All right, in that case, I will pass things on uh, to uh, Donna for patrons and circulation. Um, somebody is bringing up the fact oh, that that, H, that HTML customization tool is new. That is lower on the agenda. So I will talk about that more in depth when I, we get to technical services. Good eyes, John, good eyes. And, and then we do have a, yep. And yes, our current customizations will be copied over to the correct location of the tools once it's separated. So correct, and we'll talk about that soon. <laughs> I know that's one that a lot of people are concerned about because there is a lot of customization in there. So, but yes, it is, it is gonna be carried over, so. Awesome, all right, so again, some little things that I just, that make me happy. Um, and one big one that makes Kelly very happy, I know. So um, some of these have been covered in Monday Minutes already. And again, kudos to Kelly and Jesse for doing uh, so many of those that are so incredibly helpful. But this first one is bug 10902, which highlights the patrons from your logged in library. So for instance, I'm here logged in at the main library. And when I go ahead and search for patrons, I can go ahead and see now what library they are associated with. What is their home library? So it's very quick to be able to see which ones are at my branch versus another branch. So the logged in library highlights as green, the others are in gray. That is both under the search patrons button. It is also under the checkout button, same thing. I'll go ahead and see that information there. And then if I am in the patron section, again, 
it'll go ahead and show me in my list. It'll highlight uh, the ones in green that are at my logged in library. So nice, nice little addition just to make it a little bit faster, particularly for those of y'all with a lot of branches and a lot of people to be able to figure out who you're looking for. So um, in our continuing with our patrons. So in our patron record, if I go ahead and hit edit and scroll down, there is now the main contact method. Let me just pause for a moment while that sinks into everyone. So you can now identify what the main contact method is for your patrons. I know that many of you have customizations for identifying these things for printing them out on your hold slips all that sort of stuff there is now a option in that patron record to go ahead and select what their main contact method is um, it follows the options that you have set up in your patron registration so for instance if i did not have um, the secondary email or if i did not have the third phone number in my patron registration form using borrow or unwanted to hide those, those will not show in this drop down menu. There is a way that you can add this also to your hold slips. So if you've seen the Monday minutes that Kelly and Jesse did on that, there is the code in that one. Again, if you're your, a partner, let us know. We're happy to undo whatever we've had to do in the past and can do this with the proper um, borrower tables, which is borrowers.primary underscore contact underscore method. So a nice easy one to remember <laughs> for that. Um, but I know this is going to be a huge help for a lot of our partners um, and that will go ahead and show again in a variety of ways that you can see that one so love that absolutely love that one. Uh, this next one bug number 27873 again is more about just cleaning things up so in the past, if you had a borrower that had a lot of different notes like poor Ramona here. They displayed differently in the checkout screen and the detail screen, and they were sometimes in different places. So it was a little difficult sometimes to kind of figure out where it was and what needs to be done. But now they're all in one spot, um, and that will go ahead and show all of that information in the same order. So you'll see modifications, expirations, all of those flags, all of that sort of stuff, um, really kind of starting with the more important ones and kind of leading down to the bottom ones with the messages at the bottom. Okay, so um, again, just kind of a neat way to be able to see those for that information. Donna, you did have a question about the happy primary contact method. Mm -hmm. It didn't appear that the option for text messages was listed is that correct quite possibly i don't know that i actually even have that in though okay so let me well we store the sms number outside of the registration form we store it in right. the messaging preferences so i don't know if it would be an option in the drop down menu yeah something we'll definitely need to look into and see yep. but yeah good question good question Okay. Um, for borrowers, permissions. This is a new permission. Um, again, we are doing a lot of work as far as uh, breaking out permissions, making them even more granular than they already are. This one is our dun, 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 add, modify, and view patron information. We have now pulled out delete patrons as a separate permission. So before it was all one big permission, now we have pulled out delete. Um, remember that Koha's default is to keep things the way they are when we have a new version. So that means all of your staff that have the previous permissions for borrowing patron borrower information will have delete turned on by default. So if there are users that you do not want to be able to delete patrons, you will need to go in there and remove that permission. Because again, Koha's pro standard process is to keep things the way they are um, as far as permissions and things like that. So you will need to go ahead and remove delete patrons if you need to do it, if you need to do that with your borrowers. All right, let's look at a couple of different things real quick. So 
one of the questions, one of the things that we often get questions about are transfers and being able to identify what needs to happen with things and all sorts of stuff. So now with bug 25883, it highlights the transfer on your check-in screen. Loving this one. So I'm going to check this item in. Okay, it tells me the reason for transfer. That was one of our last upgrades was to be able to give us more information about the transfers. So yes, I am going to transfer this item. But now we have a column here showing where that item needs to be transferred to. Um, so with you know something that's just going back home, not a big deal, but sometimes there are ones that are a little bit more involved. This is for a hold. And so again, you can go ahead and see where that's supposed to be transferred to. So people wouldn't automatically assume it needs to go back to Maine. You can see exactly where that needs to be sent to. So again, just some nice little enhancements to make it clearer, to make it faster for folks that are working that front line um, when they're doing 8,000 things at once that they can go ahead and take a look and see, oh, yep, nope, that needs to go in this bin instead. Okay. Next up is 29519. This is one we have all been waiting for. This gives you the ability to resolve a claims return on check-in. <laughs> I hear you, Rebecca. <laughs> so now when you check in an item that has a claim return on it, you don't just get the message saying, hey, this item had a claim return on it. Now I actually have a block that I can go ahead and click on this resolve button. It gives me the pop up that I can go ahead and choose from my res resolutions that I've identified in my authorized values. And I'm going to say, yep, this one was returned by the patron. And I can go ahead and resolve that claim. So now when I go ahead and take a look at Dorman's account, you will see that there are no active claims there. Items been returned. I do have two claims that have been resolved. So I do love that a lot. Um, and this is something that we only mentioned in the blog post. It's not actually something that we talk about in the what's new, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, your claims are now filtered so that you'll only see um, active claims versus, and hide all the, um, all, all the resolved claims. But anyways, so yay, celebrate. You know, Donna, we just should pause here for a second and just really appreciate the community that gets together and says, Claims Return was a development by a public library just a few versions ago, and it's vastly improved with people giving their opinion, what's a better workflow, how can we streamline this, and that just gives you pause to say it's happened so quickly for this much excitement to something similarly kind of small, but great. And that's just the, the beauty of this open source community that we're part of. It really is. Um, and we do have one comment where um, there's only a couple people at the library that are allowed to do the resolves, and that's fine. That doesn't change. I can just keep going. If It's only if I click on that resolve button that will let me make that resolution. Um, if I'm not supposed to resolve those, I just still put that book to the side and keep doing what I'm doing, and that item will not be resolved. Um, so that is something to be to, to know that you know it's not going to automatically force you to resolve it. It just gives you the ability to do that now. Awesome. Okay. Um, so this next bug two two four three five. Um, oh, let's take a deep breath. This is going to be okay, everyone. It's account lines. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Heba, and she's going to do a fantastic job of explaining what exactly this has changed. Um, yeah, so account lines are something. Um, oh, sorry, I'm sharing the wrong screen. No, I'm sharing the right screen. Um, they are something that tend to come up if you are chasing down account payment weirdness. Um, so here we have a whole bunch of weird voided out things, partial payments all that stuff. Um, before you kind of had to go down the rabbit hole to see what happened and what was the history of those payments. Um, now, the thing that is really neat about this is we can see the details in one place in the order that they happened. Um, so the charge happened, that action is created. A payment was made against it, that is applied. Um, you don't have to dig down through the rabbit hole and try to reconstruct a sequence of events. Um, so this is just one of those great little quality of life um, improvements. 
The other implication of that is on the back end. Um, if you have any report that has something like cash register in the name um, that looks at your payments that came in, those often look at account offsets. Um, so we, we had to revise a bunch of reports for people with the last upgrade. Um, this one is just a really small change and that is telling it to count the offset type that says apply. Um, so before this said something like um, account offset type in payment and credit applied. Now we just simplify it to apply. Um, so if that's something where you're comfortable looking at reports, picking it out, identifying what that is, that's a really easy change you can do. Um, if you are daunted by that and you don't want to touch it at all because you're afraid you're going to break it, put in a ticket, we'll fix it for you. So compared to some of the previous account offsets and account line changes, this is a smaller one. Mm -hmm. Definitely one of those that's worth it because it makes things so much clearer when we are doing this. So thank I mean, you, just, Eva. Just look at that. Just take a moment to appreciate that. I know. <laughs> uh, you can click, you could like any of the other ones, you can click into the more details, but just being able to see that sequence of what happened and when is going to be an amazing improvement. Yeah. And, and this does follow a theme like we were mentioning where what we're a lot of what we're doing with Koha is trying to make it more user friendly and less code based and um, all of those sorts of things. So this is one of those many improvements that's guiding this way. So, all right, have a nice job on your first education uh, upgrade section. <laughs> so, okay, um, and Heba does have a blog post on this um, that we will be sharing um, to explain it a little bit more in detail and you can see all of those good things, so. Okay, so um, Cresta, I see you raised your hand. We don't have the ability to give you um, a mic or anything, but if you would just go ahead and put your question into um, chat or Q&A, unless you were just raising your hand to celebrate because you know that's that works too. So, uh, this next one is another one of those that we're, oh, no worries. <laughs> this next one is one that we are all going to oh, love. So this is bug 290115, add the option to limit the holds queue report by shelving location and collection. Yes, coming into my holds queue, I now have multiple options. So not just by my library, but I can say only show me specific item types, show me specific collections and or shelving locations. So depending on your library, I could actually come in here if I had a huge holds queue and say, you know what, only show me, I'm looking for books that are in the board books that are in the juvenile section, as opposed to your board books that are in your adult section, whatever. Um, you can go ahead and pull that as you need to. So this is a fantastic, fantastic way to do that. I know a lot of libraries have been um, doing things like pulling it into CSV and then sorting it that way, all of those sorts of things. So now you have the option to say, you know what, I only pull fiction materials. So I'm gonna go ahead and just choose fiction, hit submit, and there are my four items that I need to go grab off of the shelf. Um, again, examples of, we do have ones that are in um, different sections. This is our test site. We're all really bad catalogers, so I'm not surprised that we've got mistakes in there. But um, you've got your system set up correctly. You're going to have no problems with that holds queue being able to limit to what you need to be able to do. Uh, continuing on with holds. I know how much we love holds. This one is a sponsored development. Um, this was sponsored by Bedford Love. Uh, Bedford Public Library in Texas, Huntsville Madison County Public Library in Alabama, and Los Gatos Public Library in California. We are all appreciative of this because now when I come into my holds tab, I can go ahead and choose multiple holds to cancel all at once. All three of those holds are now gone. Um, so again, just a, a nice quick enhancement to be able to kind of clear some things out really quickly with that one. Okay. Um, last but not least, I'm calling this one the Kelly bug. This is the 28819. Y'all see our item search button? Love it, love it, love it, love it. That was one of our frustrations that you could only ever access the item search from up here at the top. 
Now it has its own button on the homepage. It has grown up, taken its place along its brothers and sisters. Um, and if you have not used item search, you are depriving yourself of one of the best functions in Koha. It does so many amazing things. So Kelly can go on and on about that. But um, that is the kind of highlights for the patrons and circulation section. So very exciting things coming. Again, we've got our blog posts up and taking a look at that. And we are going to go into everyone's favorite technical services. Yeah, why did Andrew have to have technical services as the one I'm hoping? In? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, I just actually, it's so funny. I know uh, Donna didn't use Koha before she came to Bywater, but I came, when I came to Bywater, we were at like 3.20. And the fact that we've grown to like 2111, it's so crazy. It's so fun to see everything. But we do have a question for Donna. For bulk cancellation, can staff cancel a hold for another library's patron? Yes. Mm -hmm. If you have permission to cancel the holds now, you will have permission to cancel the holds for other patrons when this goes live, um, which is one of the other questions that came up is when do these changes go live? Um, and you should start seeing um, the notifications coming on your um, staff site when we're doing the upgrades, but we are kicking them off in earnest two weeks, I believe it is. Does that sound right, everybody? I believe so. Let me see here. Okay, um, is the, got a couple of questions coming in while the other folks are looking at that. Is the bulk hold cancel available on the patron record as well? Um, I will take a quick peek at that and let you all know. No, you still only have the okay. buttons next to each of them. There's no check boxes yet, but I feel like that might be something that's already in the works, but I'll, I can look into it. Okay. And so for um, upgrades uh, for people outside of, or libraries outside of the early adopters group uh, that will begin the week of July 18th. Okay. So they'll be coming soon, less than a month and y'all will start seeing them if you're not an early adopter. Um, we do have a comment, uh, I'd like to see a change in the way lost items are handled at check-in. Something like the resolve for claims returns, if you automatically check in, it messes up those of us that use the collection agency. Um, so it sounds like what you're probably going to want to do is change your system preference. There's one that allows you to check in lost items, and it sounds like you need to turn that one off. Um, so look for the system preference that does not let you check in lost items, and that should resolve that. Um, staff can go ahead and then manually adjust it as needed, but that sounds like that might work for y'all. Um, again, if you're one of our partners, open a ticket, and we are more than happy to have conversations um, about your options with that. So we love doing that sort of thing. And Kelly, you have technical services because you're the only one that's even like remotely close to a catalog or something. <laughs> I I was in technical services back in my heyday, you know. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about some fantastic things. I linked to the blog post. It's all technical services for those that um, this is your jam. We're going to start with the rename the news tool. Sarah took away my wins there. Let me tell you, who okay. knew that was going to happen? So a few versions ago, I'll tell you a short story. A few versions ago, they said, wouldn't it be great if we moved all these system preferences that control the look of the OPAC into news? That was great for a while. However, then it got a little bit too large and a lot was going on. So then they said, it's still a great idea, but let's split it up. So we have the power of what we're going to control the look and feel of our librarian interface staying in that news section and the slip. And then all the HTML customizations that started kind of evolving into the news tool is now in its own HTML customizations tool. So when you're in tools, you have two options, both news and HTML customizations. If I click the news feature, and I create a new news feature, you can see these are the old options. These are the old Koha options where I can make 
some sort of announcement on my librarian interface. I can make an announcement on my OPAC interface and I can add something to the slip that was always there before. It's just kind of maybe gotten lost. Now, if I accidentally click the news, but I meant that HTML customizations, look at that handy dandy little click back over to the correct one. So if I click, HTML customizations, I can see all the ones that are driving the look and feel of my OPAC, such as OPAC nav bottom, the credits, the login instructions. So if I click new entry there, you can see all the ways that I can use this new revised tool of HTML customizations. This question was asked earlier, but let me confirm with you. All those will continue to move with you. It's just going to be separated a little bit in the um, visualization of this option of tools. The one system preference change that's happened, which I don't know if anybody's really like hanging out in this section of it. It is called, it used to be called the news tool editor, and now it's called the additional contents editor. Um, do, 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 did I spell additional? Who knows? There you go. Um, and this is really, maybe y'all didn't even know this existed, but this system preference has always been here, just change the names, but it's good to know that you can choose to have just a text editor when you're doing these news features, HTML customizations, or you can have that WYSIWYG, which means, Donna, you what know? you see is what you get. That's what you my see motto. is what you get. <laughs> so that's really, it's really fantastic. I 100% agree with this change because it was getting a wee bit a lot in that one news tool. So breaking it out seems to, to work better. Okay, great. I saw lots of comments and I was getting concerned because you all scare me sometimes. No, nope, everyone's excited. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. You would not think I would get this nervous anymore, but I still do. Um, okay, this, if you have more questions, let me pop into the chat. There is, I believe that's Andrew's blog post that talks about that more depth. The next one is going to be really useful for those academics or libraries that import patrons using the import tool in Koha. This is a new feature that will allow libraries to preserve a patron field from being overwritten in an import. So really, really fantastic. Sometimes you just want to maybe update a little bit of information about your patrons and not all the information about your patrons in a file, and this allows you to. So again, staying in the tools section, we're gonna go to that um, import patrons. I was like, where am I going? And preserve existing values. I love that this a few versions ago got collapsible. Um, you expand that and you could say, hey, let's keep the title how it is, um, regardless of what is in the file. So that is going to preserve fields within your patron data during an import. Really helpful. For all those who don't do this, you know, it's nice to know it does, but not really helpful to you if you don't import your patrons. Okay. Not really a lot of excitement about that one. I can see Donna. Oh, oh we, we've got it. I'm, I'm just Daniel's happy. Yay. <laughs> except, you know, he, except he wants it right now. Well, you know, Daniel, I got to say, if you were an early adopter, you have it. <laughs> an early adopter. Next time, right? Next That's time. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. Staying in the tools section. The next one is for those who use batch patron modification in any form of your day. This now has the new option to be able to use that by borrower number. So back in the day, <laughs> you could only use card number, which seemed really odd because borrower number is that number that you, everybody, you know, it's more unique. Koha's creating that. You can't really mess around with that. So when you go to the batch patron modification, this now looks very similar to our batch record modification where you have 
three tabs. So I could still do that card number. I still have the choice of using a file or listing out my card numbers, but now I also have by borrower number and of course patron list, which has always been there, but the borrower number is pretty huge. Now I'm going to pause here for a second. I did create a report and wanted to see if I could create a report and pop that into the patron modification tool like we can do with batch patron item, I mean, batch item modifications. Alas, it does not work. I will no file way. a bug. Yeah, I will file a bug to see if um, that can change because that, that's crucial. Like I could run a report and say, these are the patrons and then pop that file right into this. So that hasn't come yet, but this is a, you know, a start. So reports, I still have to have that card number. Well, reports, you could create a report to say, give me the borrower numbers and use it. But when you're in reports, you could do that the batch. for, yeah, right, for right, batch, the, the batch other batch new. tools in Koha. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I probably messed up that story really bad. No, 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 no. It's no, it's, yeah. so, it's so we it's, it's in reports using that to push to batch modification. We still have to have the bar, the card number. Um, and there's actually a couple of folks on here that I've seen that I've worked with to actually have to add card numbers in order to use this. So this is going to be very welcome once that gets finished and pushed through. Um, and we have a question of, does this extend to batch patron deletions? Which no, you I, there. I, I popped right over there, Donna. I saw that question. And I thought, hmm, batch patron deletion goes on a different theory in Koha. So you're looking at kind of a criteria of who you want to delete. It's not saying, hey, give me, let me use a list of borrower numbers or card numbers. You can use a list, but currently in Koha, it's really asking you to gather that information through actually this tool. So no, I apologize, but maybe someday if you file a bug or I can file a bug. Okay, we're headed over to the cataloging kind of section. I hate to say we don't have a ton of cataloging, but this new feature allows folks to use the mark modification tool directly from a record. So we know that the batch modification tool uses a mark modification template to say, what would I like to change about the mark record? And you can do that in bulk. Now, when you're on one singular bib record, you can apply a mark modification template directly to that bib record. So I'm in a bib record, the Dutch house. If I hit this edit, I now have a new option that says modify record using template. If I click that, I'm brought right to my batch record modification tool. You can even see my little breadcrumb has followed me to the tools. And from here, I choose the template of which I want to apply to this modification. So let's go ahead and say, I wanna suppress this, hit that modify, and then Bob's your uncle, it's all done. I'm gonna pause here to see if we're talking about you have made Sherry very you. happy. Sherry is very happy. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Um, Sandra. <laughs> and Jennifer. So you've got folks that are really loving this one. <laughs> good. Um, you are going to get a little alert to say, hey, it's going to be processed because we are getting a cube, like a task cube behind the scenes of Koha. So I could click that and see it for this singular job, it should happen pretty quick. And it did, and it says it's been modified. You can go ahead and look at it, um, or I could go straight to do this again. So that's pretty great. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Okay, now the next one I have on my list, which we could spend an hour talking about, and we will not, unfortunately, but there is a Monday Minutes, that's quite a lengthy Monday Minutes about the ability to write, protect mark fields during an import or based on the source of the import. So we did do a Monday Minutes, I'm gonna pop that in there. I think anybody who's interested in this should start in this section of learning about it because it's pretty, it has a lot of moving pieces, but the crux of it is it allows 
librarians to protect fields during importing a record, during editing a record, and you have lots of different versions of this process that can happen. Shockingly, these rules live in admin, not in tech tools. So I'm going to pop over to admin and I have a new option, record overlay rules. This is based on a permission. So you do need to allow patrons or staff people to have this permission to manage any of these overlay rules. So it's not accessible to people without that permission, which is kind of a good thing if you ask me. So you have made Sandra's day. She's been waiting for this. Um, but then we have a follow-up question of, as I understand, this does not prevent overlaying current records of batch imports, correct? Um, I guess I need a follow-up clarification question because one of the options of filtering, it allows staff or the person that's going to set up these overlay rules to say, please protect this field during a import of records. So it does apply to importing records. It applies to editing records. It applies to batch record modification, um, Z39.50. So it does apply. You can choose quite a few options here. You can choose the option to say, um, this is done by source, user category. So all the user categories of staff can or cannot do this or by username. So that super, that super cataloger can or cannot do this kind of overlay or removal of specific mark fields. So follow up, our current import over, imports overlay all records, even if they're already cataloged. We'd want to avoid overlaying records that are already in Koha. Kelly, I'm not tech services sav that savvy, but it sounds to me like we need to change the import profile on that one to not overlay if there's a matching record, right? Does that sound like that's what they're saying? Yeah, I would say you would want to submit a ticket to us and just go through your process because, you know, you do can set up record matching rules and determine whether you do want to even overlay or not overlay on those records. And this is more specific to protecting specific mark fields. Okay, Christy says she's put a ticket in there and Andrew and Sarah have worked on it. So um, we'll, we'll get that figured out and see what's going on with that one, Christy. Um, can someone define overlay? So during previous to this um, new feature, if I were to tell Koha, I have this new shiny record, can I use this one instead of my other one? It would completely replace everything that was in that record. So if I had a local note that said um, this was a donation and then but it was a short little stub record. And then I got a new record because it was a full record and I imported that in, I could overlay, I could like remove that 590 local note of my old stub record. So that would be like overlaying of that record. It's not protecting any fields before this. Now I can say when I bring in a record through this one of these processes, I could say, do not touch or protect my 590 field. So I can keep the information that I have created in that mark record. So I, what I would recommend, this is a very powerful tool. It's going to take some setup. And I think that during this process of, of kind of playing around in Koha and looking at what you think would be the best scenario, because I know a lot of librarians have wanted this feature. Um, please feel free to submit a ticket and we're happy to help you with this, depending on what you're really looking for during this process, whether that is through an import of records or just trying to protect, say, your you know, local fields when somebody goes in and edits a record and you're like, I don't want anyone to edit these local fields because we, we know people are keeping this information pretty much um, 
for good detailed notes. And I just saw Christopher's note. It does not make coffee at all. I'm sorry. Nope, no coffee involved. But I do need coffee before I think about these. That's for sure. And Sandra has a great example in the chat that what we're going to do, Sandra, is with your permission, well, without your permission, um, I know you'd be happy to share it. We're going to go ahead and pull that question out and include that as an example um, so that other folks can see how you're using it, because that's a really great example of how that can be done. Um, so it'll save a lot of time and frustration with being able to um, control certain things in there. So, um, and again, this is the first iteration of this, Kelly, right? So if people have suggestions about how to make it better, what should they do? They should go ahead and um, submit a bug or comment a bug if you find it. And if you're going to Koha Con or Koha US, both in Kansas in September, Jesse and I will be at the um, hack part of it to talk about bugs and things like that. So Donna and I will be presenting on other things, but it is really great to talk about like how can we improve these features. So yeah please, please give your two cents or 10 cents worth because um, I think it's fantastic. And this is something a lot of libraries will really appreciate and use. Christopher, behave yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more fantastic thing. And this is most of the things that we talk about. It's funny, you kind of have to remember or make a note. And this is one thing I kind of learned after going through upgrade webinars myself back in the day to remember that some things do require you to turn them on because we don't want to affect how your Koha is working now. And this is one of those um, things that you would need to turn on to be able to have access to this information. We are creating more logs in Koha. So tracking actions. If you haven't gone to your system preferences and looked at what Koha is logging at this point, maybe that's a good place to start is to go to system preferences. I just use the tab on the side and you can see what Koha is already logging, logging the actions. So if you say what happened here, you can, you're able to track those changes if you are in fact logging the actions that are happening. So you can see I have some things that are not being logged, my renewal logs, my notices, come on, we should be tracking those notices. Oh. I mean, we saw in 2105, you could like actually see the difference between the two changes in notices. I thought we turned those on, but I will say, I'm gonna interrupt, there's a surprise. Um, for all of y'all that have admin permissions, check your news log, check your notices log in particular, that um, those are really helpful to have turned on, especially over the last couple of years as we keep changing notices because things happen. Um, and again, this goes along with Koha not changing its current behavior, so these were not turned on. So definitely listen to Kelly's advice on this one. Check those logs and turn those on. They're incredibly, incredibly helpful. And report log. That's another big one. That's nice to be able to see um, what's being tracked. I can definitely show you how to get here again. All my system preferences live in Koha Admin. I clicked my global system preferences so I could get the big list. I could type in the word log and probably get them all if I wanted to, but I know logging is its own tab on the side. So if I just pick that global system preferences and then come down to that logs on the left. But again, that search will will search any word within global system preferences. So I could just start with log if I wanted to. So author uh, authorities, no, acquisition logs is what we're introducing in Koha 2111, which is really fantastic. You can see I already have it turned on, but this is where you can see. Something to note, all logs that are turned on are saved by default for 180 days. If this is something you need to change, um, please go ahead and submit a ticket. But by default, that is how long they're saved. To get to the logs, we're gonna go back to tools because that's okay, my- Chris, yep. Christopher stirring up trouble. <laughs> oh no. He's asking what's the best way to view the, to view the logs. Yes, so if I hit more from here, I can go to tools or I could go home, go to tools. Um, where are we? Log viewer under the far right column. And you can see all the modules. This is really handy to know. We'll show. 
If I'm not logging those, I'll have this little exclamation point to say, hey, this is not turned on. So that's really actually a nice feature as well to say, mm. and if I hover, you can see my log is not enabled. If I unclick modules and I just look at acquisitions, I can go ahead and you'll be able to see, look at them all, modify a basket, modify an acquisition basket, modify an order, create an order, cancel an order, reopen a basket, approve a basket. All of these will be logged. Andrew created this blog post. Thank you, Andrew. And logs are a little different when you're going to search for that object or that info. And he tells you in that blog post to say, hey, if you want to look at the log for modifying a budget and you're looking for something specific, the object is the budget period ID. So if I said, hey, let's go ahead and look for modifying a budget, I could go ahead and add the budget period ID and run it and I could see all the modifications to that budget itself. For funds, the object is the budget ID. So there's a little snippet of information there, but he does talk about that in there. And it's really fantastic to be able to say, hey, let's look at everything that's been um, logged within the system. If you've never looked at your logs, let me see if I can get this on my screen. Um, I just specifically looked for modify budget. I didn't give a date range. I actually didn't even know if there was any modifications. I can see the date and time. I can see who did it. So that's the user that was logged in, um, what the action was, modify budget. And then I get a little bit of information to lead me to what in fact was changed. And it looks like my, I added some money in my budget. So that's really helpful. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. We appreciate you jumping in. Yeah, once again. So, okay, we have two minutes and now back to Sarah to finish the last three bugs. You can do right. this, right? Yes. Sorry, sorry. I'm the worst. No, 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 no. Time. I'm a time hog. No, you are, you are great. Thank you again for being here. Um, all right. So I will run through these. Um, changes for uh, administration and reports. Um, so the first one is, uh, it's a couple of bugs, uh, 28445, which is use that using the task queue for the batch delete and batch uh, item modification tool. And then 29020 um, adds a miss missing background jobs link in administration. Um, so some of this was backported, so you may have seen some of it, um, but if it wasn't something that you have seen, uh, can be useful, so I want to point it out here. Um, so previously with batch item modification, so this is this system is still running on 2105. So I do a batch modification and say this is a donation. So I get my results here which is great to be able to see what I did. This is the non-public note that I added. Um, but then if I want to see this again, I don't have a way to do that as a batch item modification. I can always look at the um, modification log for this bib, but I don't have a way to see this full table again. Um, but now, so we've got here in, that's my screen. So in, from home, in Koha administration, we have a new link for manage background jobs. And so what this will do is it will show you every um, batch um, bib record modification, batch hold cancellation. That is also a new addition, um, batch item, item modification and batch item deletion. Um, previously in 2105 um, batch, item let me see here it was batch um record modification was included but batch record deletion was not so there are a whole lot more things that are showing here and so what you can do is jump into the view and see exactly what happened with that modification so this will show me all of these holds that were canceled together 
Um, similarly, for a batch record modification, batch item modification rather, it's going to bring me back to that table. So if there were a bunch of um, items that were modified at once, I could see those full results from here. Um, so this can be really nice for tracking, transparency, just being able to track down what happened with that one act. Um, the This is controlled by a system preference. So this account that I'm using right now has super librarian um, permissions. And the permission is <laughs> it's manage background jobs. So if uh, someone has managed background jobs, they are going to have that link on their um, under administration and they'll be, be able to see everyone's background jobs. Uh, but one of the nice uh, other additions that is part of this is that someone who does not have that managed background jobs permission. Um, so I'm logged in now under Nancy Drew's account. I do not have that permission. I can't even get to the administration module but I still do have this um, link on my um, homepage of the staff internet or staff client to access my own background jobs. So someone else can still go and see all of their jobs, even if they don't have access to everyone else's. Uh, so Sarah, we have two questions about this. Okay. One is, does it tell you what the modification was? Yes, let me jump back into. So it will tell you here and the um, it'll give you the type here. It's a bit, um, it, it says item record modification and other places in Koha, it will refer to a batch item modification just as batch item mod modification without the record there. Um, but it does distinguish them by bibliographic record, which is going to be batch record, what we see in tools as, um, batch record modification and batch record deletion. And then for batch item deletion and batch item modification, it will list them as batch item record deletion or batch record, batch item record modification. But it doesn't necessarily tell me that I changed ah, I see. location, that sort of thing, right? No, from here it does not. It will show you the new um, information, but it will not say what the action was. I'm imagining, Heba, we could probably write a report that says in this batch number, what was changed on those items or something like that. I'm sure there's got to be a way to be able to identify that. That's something we'll take a look at and see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, the I other would have to look into that. The other thing is you could probably catch some of that from the cataloging action log. Right. That's what I'm thinking is that we're narrowing it down by time of when it happened. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the other question is, can you modify them again from that screen and you um, cannot rerun that modification? No, no, it's not like a saved action in that yeah. sense. Yeah. All right. And OK, uh, so the next one, um, there's not a ton to show for these next ones. Uh, there are some really useful updates to crons. Um, so. Let me jump over here to tools. Um, so back to what Kelly was talking about with all the logs that are more recently available. Um, there are also new options for how long um, information in logs is saved before it gets cleared. So as you mentioned, the default is 180 days, um, but the new option, again, unfortunately there's not a whole lot that um, I can show for this, but uh, the bug is 18631. Um, it's cleanup database should take an option for modules and action logs. So what that means is your cleanup database um, cron is what cleans up the information in these. Um, and there are two new options. So instead of having everything cleaned up at that either 180 or whatever other interval you specify, um, there's now an option for um, log modules, which will clean only the logs that you select at that given time and leave everything else as is. Um, and then preserve logs, which is the inverse. Um, it will preserve only the logs that you name and clean all the others. 
Um, so this is not something that you can do from the staff interface, but if it's something that you're interested in, uh, send in a ticket and we'll get you set up. Uh, that system team will get you set up with um, either cleaning those specific logs um, at the interval that you want or preserving specific logs and cleaning all the others. Um, there is a blog post that goes into more detail about this. I will put that in the chat momentarily. Um, all right. And then for another cleanup database update, we've got 25429, which is cleanup database should remove resolved claims returned after X days. Um, so this comes with a new system preference which is called cleanup database return claims. And so what this will do is remove, uh, as it says, resolved return claims older than X number of days. Um, and so to look back in a claim, so in this account, um, this person has two resolved claims and zero um, unresolved claims. And so what the system preference would do is clean up those two claims, just remove them after the 20 days um, and one of the reasons that this is really nice is that it works. Um, it can help claims returned warning threshold work um, more efficiently, I guess you could say, um, because claims returned warning threshold does not distinguish between resolved and unresolved claims. So this account right here that has two resolved claims, if someone tried to make another claim on this account, that warning would come up. Um, but if the resolved claims are being automatically removed after the 20 days, um, there is less of a chance that uh, resolved claims will be hanging out, hanging out in people's accounts, having that notification come up where it's not actually relevant because the thing that you care about are their unresolved claims. Um, so this is, and you can set the number of days there, um, and then as long as cleanup database um, never hurts to check with us sending in the ticket um, for the systems team to make sure that your cleanup database um, cron is good to go otherwise, but this one can be set from here. Um, and then finally, we've got um, 28456. Um, again, this is one that unfortunately does not have a whole lot to show, um, but it is add an option to use a where statement in the membership expiry uh, cron job which is the cron job that sends an email to, um, sends reminder emails when patrons' accounts are getting close to expiring. Um, so now, oops. So um, right now we've got membership expiry days notice, sending an account expiration notice when the patron's card will expire in X days. So now, in addition to having your X days here, you can add where statements that are based on the borrowers table in the database schema. Um, so for instance, you could say, uh, send this email where their home library or home branch is one specific home branch. So then it would only affect patrons who had that as their home branch. Um, or you could have, get this up here. Um, or you could only send it, so you could use branch code there. You could send it to only specific patrons, um, patrons belonging to a specific category code. So if you wanted to exclude your self-registered patrons, uh, for instance, you could send it to everyone except them. Um, so this can make those membership expiration emails a little more targeted um, and hopefully allow some libraries that were avoiding it um, because it was so broad to be able to send it out um, more widely or be able to make more use of it. Um, and I see a question. So Rebecca is asking, um, can you set two dates for two different patron types? And from looking at the cron, I believe we can. We may need to do a little bit of finessing with that. Um, I don't write crons. There's a reason to keep me on the front end, not the back end. But from looking at how it is structured, we should be able to do that. Yes. Kelly, Sarah, is that what y'all think too? I I'm not, I'm less sure about the dates, um, but either way, that wouldn't be something that could be set, um, but it would have to be in the cron itself, as Donna said, so we wouldn't, there wouldn't be options for two dates in the system preference, um, but we can definitely confirm with the systems team. Um, 
any other oops, questions on that one? That's one of those against here that I wish there was more that we could show because I know. That, that so many people ask for that. No. Um, you know, kind of limit by branch, by patron category, all of those sorts of things. So that's really exciting that we finally have that in there. Yeah. Um, there is a question of, has there been any update on the problem with trying to limit a search to available items, particularly with a specific branch or location? Not sure what that one is, Aaron. Um, probably I need a little bit more information on that. Sorry. Um, and then another question is, could we have two different notices for two different types? Regular patrons would get one and self-reg would get a different one. I don't think looking at the options in the cron, it oh, yes, we can. There is an option for the letter code. Um, so it looks like we could potentially have two different notices for two different patron categories, Michelle. We would definitely want to get um, our, our experts on that one, but it looks like according to what's in the Quran that we would be able to do that one. And what we've, um, can, if, if for some reason that does not end up being an option, um, sending out notices through patron email or maybe an option as well, depending on exactly what you need to, what you need to do with that. So, well, that was fast and furious, very wild. Thank you all for sticking with us. We know we went a little bit over, um, but hopefully it was helpful to y'all and you found at least one or two things that you're interested in. Um, as we said, we'll go ahead and post this. We'll post all the questions. We'll find out um, answers to the questions that we've been asked that we didn't know about and confirm those. Still no coffee. Christopher, I am so very sorry, but you know what? It's so hot here today. Who wants coffee? I got to say, um, unless it's iced coffee. But anyways, um, thank you all for sticking around. Again, we will have our Q&A sessions in the week of July 4th, I believe, right, Sarah? So in two weeks. Yes. Um, so go ahead and take a look at our intranet.bywatersolutions.com. That is uh, login with Bywater Bywater. That's our demo site. It has been upgraded. I've just confirmed that. So you can go ahead and take a sneak peek at 2111. And we hope to see you all soon. Hope everyone has an awesome day. Thank you, everyone. Bye.